welcome to the Capital Employed podcast. In this episode, I had the pleasure of talking to Mark Walker, the managing partner at Tollymore Partners. Since launching the fund in 2016 until the end of 2020, Tollymore has generated a return of 28% per annum net of all fees and expenses, which is a great performance. So I was keen to get Mark onto the show to learn more about his investment style and philosophy. In this episode, Mark also talks about two companies that he feels have great long-term potential. I really enjoyed listening to him and I think you will too. Before we jump into this episode, do make sure to add your email to the Capital Employed email list. We will be publishing some exclusive interviews that will only be available to those on the list. To receive these bonus episodes, please visit capitalemployed.fm forward slash exclusive and add your email to the list. One final note, yesterday I added all the stocks that have been discussed on the podcast so far into a spreadsheet and was surprised to see that if you had bought all of these stocks on the first trading day of the year and held until now, your return to date would be 57.5%. Now of course, just as we write in the podcast show notes every week, this podcast does not offer investment advice or stock recommendations. The podcast is for educational and informational purposes only. It would also be impossible to create a Capital Employed podcast index anyway, as we are taking this performance from the start of the year, not when the guest comes onto the show. However, what this does highlight to me is the quality of the guests we've had on the podcast so far. So thank you to all those guests who have appeared, and thanks to everyone who has downloaded and subscribed to the podcast. It is very much appreciated. Okay, no more rambling from me. Let's get on with this week's episode. Please enjoy my conversation with Mark. Hi Mark, thanks for coming on to the podcast. Thanks for the invitation to talk with you, my pleasure. Can you give a brief overview of uh, Tollymore Partners and also what the investment style and, and philosophy is? So Tollymore manages capital for its principals and a small group of partners who I'd say have sort of demonstrated some ability to think somewhat unconventionally. We're trying to make decisions in the interests of long-term results, uh, which means that, you know, I think that most of those results should really come from the internal earnings power growth of the companies we hold. What it means is that, uh, you know, we don't expect good results to come from any IQ advantage, um, but from very simple synergies between the components of an investment firm. So the investment horizon, temperament, working environment, incentives, and investment partners. That last element, the investment partners, is really crucial, I think. You know, I think that flourishing relationships drive enduring contentment. And so, you know, we're trying to discover win-win outcomes in investing. And, uh, that's really, you know, Tollymore's reason for being. And I believe you're quite concentrated as well in your approach. Is it between, between 12 and 15 holdings? Yeah, that's right. The, the sort of remit, there's no hard hard rules around this, but the remit is 10 to 15 securities. And we've actually sort of gravitated towards the lower end of that range. And what type of businesses do you like to invest in? What characteristics do you normally look for? We look at all kinds of businesses. You know, in a nutshell, all we're trying to do really is to find really good, really cheap businesses. So I'll, I'll come back to that idea of cheapness in a minute, but you know, our edge doesn't come from being analytically better than ever, anybody else. It just comes from something more simple than that. It's, it's a willingness to look at everything, you know, a willingness to just do some digging into, um, you know, the characteristics of the businesses, as you refer to it, that might be conventionally regarded as low quality. And, and there's no predetermined ways. I'm, I'm trying to form a positive conclusion on those characteristics. What's important is that each potential investment candidate is assessed at a face value and, and using available facts. And we're just trying to extract insights from first principles as much as possible. And by doing that, I'm trying to avoid, you know, analytical errors by, you know, that, that are often made by using mental shortcuts. I think that the more we shorten the description of an investment process, you know, the more memorable it is for sure, but I don't think that, that means it's more repeatable. And so, and the second, you know, point about cheapness, I'd say that we're value investors because our goal 
is to pay prices that allow us an equity IRR at least as good as the company's own intrinsic value growth. But I think that labels like value investor, they they restrict the freedom and the honesty, you know, with which we can try to understand the investment credentials of companies. And I think what we've seen in use in recent years is that they just, you know, those labels really give an excuse to underperformers investing according to style factors, which is the unpopularity of their particular style. And that's led to, you know, a failure to own up to bad investment results. So if there's a single observation, you know, has informed what value investing means to me, it's that the cost of growth for really great companies has just been systematically underestimated throughout time. You know, Visa and MasterCard are the often cited examples of this. You know, businesses that have been consistently underpriced, you could have paid 80 or 100 times after-tax profits a decade ago and still earn a market return. That's because of this heuristic that high growth warrants a high multiple and, and doesn't consider the cost of growth, which is the proportion you know, of prior year earnings needed to achieve that growth. And it underscores why for us, business quality standards are just non-negotiable. And they should be, and those and those standards should be applied to all investment opportunities, whether you're classically regarding yourself as value or growth or GARP. You know, I think I think an interesting example, a more modern day example, is that, you know, if you think about it from first principles, whether the you know the economic characteristics of modern uh, SaaS companies are desirable, like I think that it's clear that most market participants believe these business models to be vastly superior to software of, of the past. Now, that observation alone already kind of tips the odds against you of, of achieving a, a decent result. But if you sort of dig into you know, the business model and understand that this transition, this transition that's taken place to vendor hosted subscription models, you know, certainly seems to have better unit economics than software of the past in, in the medium term. And the web-based customer adoption models that have taken taken out the customer acquisition friction. That's what's like ignited much more rapid growth again in the medium term. But if you then consider the very long term, you know, if our only advantage here is a time arbitrage one, this very factor that's ignited the rapid growth in, in enterprise software businesses, which is the removal of this friction, has that also removed the software mode, right? This, the switching costs. Now, I, I use this example partly from a place of bitterness, right? Because we haven't owned um, SaaS companies, Tollymore's not owned pure play SaaS companies. It's not owned big tech. You know, it's not owned uh, healthcare, consumer staples. And that's not because of, not owned them because of an anticipation of the market's pendulum swinging, you know, what the value investor might describe as like a mean reversion. But it's really just an output of requiring individual stocks to jump very high quality and valuation and valuation hurdles. That's cost, you know, on the one hand, our, our inability to think very creatively about when prior base rates just aren't relevant anymore. That's cost our investment partners because we've not owned these sectors that have undergone substantial re-ratings um, in recent times. But on the other hand, price, you know, absolutely matters. Microsoft took 15 years to reach the 2000 high despite very strong and steady business progress. And, and price matters because it's, you know, it's one of the very small number of determinants of IRR. You know, we, rather than asking the question, you know, will, will SaaS company valuations mean revert, which might be implied by prior cycles, we, we try and ask, is it really obvious to me that by buying this multiple of company X that my IRR will be really quite remarkable? And I, I think it's those types of microeconomic discussions and thoughts that, that we find interesting in our we think are worth doing if you know if we are, have a chance of, of creating value what are your valuation uh, parameters is there just a certain p multiple or do you use discounted um cash flow how, how do you come to your valuation we try and think about valuation from multiple angles and sort of triangulate those angles we're typically not building detailed financial models um you know and anticipating a future predetermined path or, or outcome for a company. Um, a central valuation framework that we do typically rely on is one of 
Bruce Greenwald uh, EPV valuation framework, where we're just trying to think about what are the owner earnings of this business. So what are the, what is the cash the company could put in the pockets of owners today, uh, if it if invested what it needed to to preserve you know output and competitive positioning, and what is that as a price? You know what is that as a yield to the cost of ownership of the company? And then the second step is sort of think about what the company is going to do, what it should do, and what it's going to do with those owner earnings, and what kind of um, of incremental returns are uh, available and for how long. You know, when we get really excited, it's when we think that the unit economics are very different to the aggregate economics of the business. It's the aggreg- aggregate economics that are obviously presented in financial statements and are appearing on um, on various screens. And so when, when we think that they're not reflecting the economic reality or the economic potential of the company, um, is often the sort of... Uh, the ignition for our, our work. Can you talk us through two companies in your fund that you feel have been a bit underappreciated by the market and you feel have good long-term potential? Sure. Well, two, I mean, so I'm speaking from uh, the UK today, so totally more based in London. And there are two UK businesses that we purchased in the last 12 months that you know, I think have a very underappreciated um, an outsized potential for um, extraordinary equity IRRs. And um, they're Next PLC and Farfetch. Next is sort of typically, I think, perceived in the UK as this very credible, um, safe, single fashion brand operating, distributing products predominantly through brick and mortar outlets across the UK. But I think that the reality would our reality has slowly been changing and that change has been accelerating over the last year or 18 months. The reality is that Next is actually a multi-geography, multi-brand, omni-channel retail operating system. And so some of these changes, you know, as I said, I think that the changes initially started happening around five years ago where um, Next opened up its offering to other brands via a vertically integrated wholesale model. And then more recently, since 2019, via a marketplace model. And that's been extended then to an operating system for third-party brands in, in 2020. In the provision of these services for brands and suppliers, your next store network, which is obviously typically seen as you know, a low quality way to operate a business is, is actually a very crucial component of the online value chain. Um, and that's for a couple of reasons. One is that most of the most orders are collected or just over half of orders are collected in the stores. And around 80% of returns of online returns are returned to a store. Secondly, the delivery is around two thirds of fulfillment cost typically in the last mile is the most expensive component. So by saving that and reinvesting that into the consumer proposition, Next is in this sort of, uh, I think, unique uh, position in the in the UK apparel industry. Aspects of the competitive positioning are, are consistent with what we have, talk, have called over the years sort of value chain symbiosis, which is basically that there's a very strong customer and supplier proposition. The consumer proposition comes from two factors. One is, uh, you know, of online retailers, one is product choice much greater SKU variety, and the other is convenience. Former, I think, is much more important than the latter, and which is good for Next because I think the former is much more difficult to replicate than the latter. And then the, the supplier proposition is one um, of providing a, a multi-brand context in which to sell the, the supplier's products. 80% of shopping has historically been taking place in multi-brand, whether that's offline or online, multi-brand environments. And, you know, that's the limitation of kind of pure play operating system models, such as Shopify. And then the, the desire for direct-to-consumer relationships or customer proximity is the limitation of pure play marketplace models, most obvious sort of being Amazon. And so by providing this sort of hybrid solution, Next allows brands to avoid the fixed cost step ups um, associated with growth and allows them to focus on the customer and the product, which is what they enjoy doing. So in return for around a 39% commission, those brands get access to 8 million customers growing 25% a year. 
they have, have the ability to control price and, and um, representation of their products. They have access to a next day delivery network and returns to next stores and a consumer lending service as well, administered by Next. And I think that you know a lot of Next progress has been driven by some reasonable managerial foresight, but also they've enjoyed having the right model at the right time, which is something we've observed in a number of our holdings. COVID has really um, shaken up the UK apparel industry and there's been a lot of restructuring and and there's the stores that have fallen into administration or difficulties. There's a high cross shop between Next and those stores. Thinking about sort of, you know, the group, so that's, you know, how we determine what the owner earnings of this business might be like and what how sustainable they are by virtue of this competitive positioning. And then the question is, well, what are the profitable avenues for redeploying this growth? I think the growth opportunity is attractive through the lens of a UK apparel market, which is 100 times uh, larger than Next's multi-brand store. It's really the, the quality of the supplier and consumer proposition, I think, that should lead to continued penetration growth online. And then you have adjacencies into more SKUs and more brands, but also more verticals such as home and beauty. And that growth is, you know, so I talked about this heuristic, this error that high multiples are typically warranted for high growth companies without really understanding the cost of growth. Well, the cost of, you know, this growth for next is very valuable. So as they increasingly direct capital investments to warehouses versus retail stores, well, those have very high asset turns, five or six times asset turns, and are and they're generating. 20% after tax margins and the, the incremental returns on their online marketing efforts overseas are you know in the order of 2 to 400%. You know what are you paying for this business? Well, you know I think the owner earnings are in the order of a, million, a billion uh, pounds. And so you're sort of paying around 10 times of that or you know which I think assumes no value creation and I think that everything of you know touched upon to me suggests that there's pl- plenty of evidence to to the contrary. And then the second, so the second business, Farfetch, is in many ways has sort of similarities to to Next, but through a sort of different vertical, and it's a much more global business. So it's a it's a luxury online marketplace for brands and retailers and consumers. Like Next, it also offers what they call Farfetch platform solutions. You know, white label operating system. So they are effectively providing the Amazon and Shopify um, of luxury, and the consumer proposition is very similar. It's that most products are sold in multi-brand environments. The marketplace model is uh, superior to the vertically integrated peers that Farfetch has because of greater skew variety, which facilitates this sort of rapid iteration, like understanding very quickly which products are working and which price points and how to present those products. And also facilitates a kind of newness or freshness, which is so crucial in the luxury industry. And again, the supplier proposition is one of you know luxury brands being very preoccupied with brand integrity, wanting control over pricing and visual representation, and superior unit you know, economics for brands who are much higher gross margins by partnering with Farfetch. You know, competitive positioning is facilitated by global two-sided network effects, which are strong by virtue of very fragmented supply. Um, you know, luxury inventory is distributed via this very fragmented network of boutique sellers. They don't really have any any competition with this business model. They're the only scaled luxury luxury marketplace. And also, like Next, I think that they've been in the right place in the right time, which is that they've demonstrated anti-fragile qualities, right? They've really, the two years where Farhead has really thrived, in my opinion, are 2008 2020, you know, periods of distress as uh, their partners, um, you know, really leaned into those relationships to times when the boutiques were either forced to shut their doors or were facing a you know, material drop off in demand. They provided this outlet, this ability to, to keep the lights on. So that's something that's you know, compounded the goodwill and the relationships they have with those brands over the last decade plus. The growth opportunity is, uh, you know, characterized by a very large $400 billion global luxury market, which might be a sort of 30 to $40 billion online commission pool and you know, versus a couple of billion of, of revenues for Farfetch. And they have a very clear framework for value accretive 
investment, very trackable you know, definitions of what a lifetime value and acquisition cost might look like. You know, I think that there's been a lot uh, more optionality for exponential valuable growth coming out of China with a, you know, a partnership that they have struck with Alibaba and Richemont. You know, China's been a very, very difficult market for many, many Western businesses to crack. And Farfetch has been no, you know, no exception. They've tried different partnerships, which haven't really um, worked too well. But, but now this, uh, this new partnership really gives them access to around 800 million consumers on Alibaba's team wall. And so just having a very small modicum of success um, in penetrating that could be really transformational to their ability to succeed in, in China. Again, through this sort of owner earnings valuation lens, I think it's a business that generates four to five hundred million dollars of owner earnings, and that's being reinvested at really quite extraordinary incremental returns. Even if you make very modest assumptions about the useful economic life of customers and order frequency and contribution margins, etc., so I think it's a business that you know that can earn an equity IRR of 40 percent plus for quite a long time. Thanks, Mark, for sharing those two companies. Are you a keen reader? And if so, have you read any book recently that you, you really enjoyed? Um, yeah, I think the, the book I've most enjoyed reading this year is The School of Life by Alain de Botton. The book really thinks about or discusses this sort of the gaps that might exist in our, you know, our formal education journeys. And this is something, you know, my my son has just started started school this year, and so something I'm kind of thinking about more and more. But you know, efforts I think in education are typically focused on, you know, becoming successful in technical areas, right? science and maths, rather than emotional areas. This book certainly contends there's insufficient effort or focus directed to being successful in relationships or managing anxiety or how to be kind. And so, what Botan is like content, you know, is is arguing really that this has sort of led to this somewhat like lopsided. You know, evolution where, where we've had this very rapid and vast technological progress, but that's been managed by humans who, you know, emotionally evolved very little. And I think that this book has some interesting ideas about how to let go of this myth of a perfect life. You know, if you're trying to be emotionally mature, right? no one is normal. <laughs> and, and actually, the recognition if you can recognize and accept the flaws in ourselves and others. And that can be quite a healthy motivator for, for empathy and kindness. Ostensibly, I guess, a non-investing book, but I can certainly see the value and think, you know, emotional intelligence and self-awareness, I, you know, I think are superpowers in investing. And so they're worth striving for. I think the common, you know, the common thread that I find with good books, the ones that I enjoy, which are probably the minority of the ones that I read, is not that they kind of give me this feeling that, I have the world figured out. You know, they're not there to make me sound smarter, but they actually, they do the opposite, right? They, they reiterate how little I know. They sort of entrench this, hopefully this humility that I think is required for successful investing. Where can um, listeners go to find out more about you and Tollymore Partners? Uh, our website is tollymorepartners.com. And my email address is mark at tollymorepartners.com. They're probably the best places to sort of find out more and, and contact me. Thanks so much, Mark, for coming on to the show. It's been a pleasure to listen to you. It's been really nice to chat.